Hey there. So today I'm going to be talking to none other than Paul Baresi. I mean, he's he's an interesting one. Paul, how are you doing today, man? I'm doing well. Paolo Giuseppe Baresi. Baresi. <laughs> Baresi uh, from Catania, Sicily. A lot of people have probably seen the headline. The Hollywood fixer and the private investigator hired by Amber Heard that. So how would you boil that down? Well, I'm a go-to guy. My reputation is that I'm good at dealing with uh, sexually based scandal. And uh, I've proven myself over and over. I've, I've put out sexually based fires, scandals for the likes of uh, Tom Cruise, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Sylvester Stallone, Eddie Murphy. Uh, the list goes on and on. Looking at high, a lot of people don't even know anything about the process of how someone like you gets involved period My, myself included i'm sure there's a you know there's there's hollywood portion that we you know we've we've added on to that so when you're approached to do this can you explain how that how how that comes about sure okay well let's keep it in the context of of johnny versus amber sure in the summer of uh, 2019 i received a call from Eric George, he's one of the preeminent entertainment lawyers in the country. And I had a good track record with him. I had already successfully uh, investigated a, a couple of matters for him. And so he told Amber about me and said, look, we're going to investigate Johnny Depp. Paul Baresi would be the best guy for the job. And I told Eric when he called me that I was up for the task. Uh, how far back do you want me to go in my investigation? Because my primary mission, as told to Eric by Amber, was to look for uh, instances of bad conduct uh, in accordance with what she alleged. In other words, find other women who Johnny Depp abused. Sure. And... Um, it's been widely reported. Uh, I started the investigation in early July 2019, and I ended my investigation toward the end of September. And I spoke with many people, and uh, it was dig, dig, dig. I knocked on a lot of doors. A lot of people wouldn't talk to me uh, for the obvious reason. They didn't want to burn bridges. They didn't want to bring scandal upon themselves. Sure. But those who did talk, had nothing but glowing, wonderful things to say about Johnny Depp. And uh, it wasn't until April uh, 2020, long after I had stopped working for Amber, did I put a story out with the Daily Mail uh, talking about this uh, in length. But like any investigation, you find other things that are not necessarily central to, uh, to the objective or central to what you're going after, but they're extraordinary things. And I thought it would make for some great story. It's called collateral evidence. I uncovered during my investigation, uh, various legal documents and other exhibits, which I talked to you about, uh, which place events in Johnny's life in a, a broader historic content. And these items, though they're historic, uh, they're no less extraordinary because they illuminate the significance of those events, if you follow me. Right. And uh, even before Johnny was born, I uncovered a document, a marriage certificate, a marriage license between his mom and the marriage between his mom and dad. And okay, it's one piece of paper, but what did that tell me? Well, it told me some interesting things. It told me that Johnny's dad was four years younger than his mom. It told me the date that they, they were married. And it, it told me that the first child, Johnny's sister, was born uh, 10 months later which tells me, again, that they married out of love. They didn't marry because they had to get married. 
And that's meaningful. Sure. That tells me something about how their relationship began. Because a lot of people, as you know, uh, at least back in my day, maybe not so much now, certainly back then when they got married in, uh, uh, what was it, 19... 1960 they married um you know if you got a woman pregnant the man generally had to marry the woman and so for me that was telling it's a, a telling piece of history about johnny depp even before he was born and then of course after his sister came along uh, he came along thereafter uh, there was another item i found uh, an article uh, from the Corbin, Kentucky Sunday Times dated September 7th, 1969. Johnny was six years old. And what it is, it's the headline. The headline reads, Frankfurt Fires City Manager. It was the big story in the paper that day. Well, they're talking about Johnny Depp's dad. They're publicly firing him and humiliating him and embarrassing him. And the first thing that came to mind was this is in continuity with what Johnny's going through with the alleged firing from Pirates and the Fantastic Beasts franchise. And in the article, it discloses that Johnny Depp's dad, when he got fired and after all this public humiliation, he just took it on the chin and said, there'll be better things in the horizon. See you later. And I'm thinking to myself, wouldn't Johnny do well to follow his father's lead? Look at the lesson that his father taught him just by doing that. And I'm thinking that that took some bravery on his dad's part. What a beautiful quality. And I read the whole article uh, I can post it. I will post it, and your listeners can can look at it. Sure. But what it told me was that Johnny's dad is saying, keep a modest view of your own self-importance, number one. If you get knocked on your ass, get right back up on your feet. Walk away. And and fighting, fight only for the things that uh, that matter and believe that better opportunity is going to follow you tomorrow or in the, in, be in the horizon. Then I made a comparison. I said, you know, Johnny extolled his stepdad, uh, Palmer. I can't remember his first. Was it Robert Palmer? Uh, and after reading that article, I said, Palmer couldn't hold a candle to Johnny's dad. And maybe Johnny is a reflection of his dad. Hmm. And so if Johnny inherited some great qualities from his dad. He should, and he acknowledged that. I think later on in life he acknowledged it. But that little piece of uh, history, I think, is very telling. And it, like you say, the golden word humanizes him. Mm -hmm. You know, there's another document uh, around the time Johnny's mom and dad divorced where Johnny's father had a, another dispute with the city uh, on another city job and he filed suit against the city. And uh, I called the judge who presided on that case. He didn't have a clear recollection of it, but he knew enough to tell me, yeah, it had something to do with a dispute. It could have been a, uh, a firing or something of that which tells me that, yes, Johnny's dad had a hard time holding down a job. Well, so haven't we all. But I was talking about Johnny's dad. Uh, he and his mom divorced March 4th, 1981. And uh, Johnny had just turned 18. But they made an agreement where they would divide up the property, they would sell the home and divide up the property. The mother, his mom, stood before a judge and uh, under oath 
and told the judge, oh, my son is, uh, yes, he's a minor. He's 17. He'll be 18 in a few months, but he's fully emancipated. He's self-sufficient. He's doing fine on his own. Now, of course, she lied. And that was very telling. Uh, so I looked in a little deeper. I found out that Johnny was not only at the time financially on the balls of his ass, but he was living in the backseat of a car and uh, eating canned beans wow. to survive. So that's how bad it was for the kid. Wow. Now, now the father, his father, did he take a back seat? Remember what I said? He was younger than Johnny's mom. So I, I don't want to use the term he, he, that maybe she wore the pants in the family. But I think that, you know, when you get married in your early 20s, if someone's two, three, four years uh, older than you at that age, they're much more mature than you are. So that was telling too just that little piece of information it told me that perhaps johnny's mom is the one who called the shots and johnny's dad not being a confrontational guy uh let her call the shots i think john's a, a lot of like his dad hmm. which Jeez. is both something i think it's something uh both, uh, it, it can be nice, but it can also be a curse. I think that. I think, I think that story of perseverance was also, you know, a, a lot of people that spoke about about Johnny Depp. They leave out the lean years. You know, they start at the beginning of finally breaking through, finally having success. They don't include stuff like that. I mean. You know, when you when you sp when you mentioned that, that that was actually the first time I'd ever heard of that before. So I thought that was. Well, there's a lot of things that you, uh, that I found information I found that have not has not really been been fully revealed uh, to the to the public, and that's why these documents are are so uh, interesting. Now, as it turns out, I found another document that shows that eight months before. Johnny's mom and dad divorced. Johnny's dad uh, enlisted the services of a psychiatrist who specialized in marriage counseling. Now, I don't know with absolute certainty if that means that he tried to save his marriage uh, before the divorce, but it certainly suggests that. So to me, that's an, another admirable quality to chalk up for Johnny's dad. It was very enlightening. So you understand when I say, although the documents are historic, they're really no less extraordinary. They're, they make for a great story. And I think one of your listeners is absolutely right when, when he said, boy, does Paul have a, a great book? He needs to write a book. Oh, yeah. Well, I, think I, I think I have volumes here. Yeah, I, I I agree. I mean, just just a few of the things that you, I'm just just a small <laughs> taste of what you put out there was. I was like, wow. Little, At least you can a little piece of uh, tidbit. Huh? You know, uh, a small step for man, a big step for mankind. You sure. see the the humanity that go that magic word that that really sunk in. Uh, and I thank you for that because I think we need to start looking at people more. Uh, uh, from the human level, yeah, I mean we've we've talked about a lot of about that, you know, as we as we uh, as we build towards this, and that seems to be what you know with your investigation, you you build a complete picture. You weren't just trying to go out and find something to to vilify or slander someone; you were trying to understand them. Again, a lot of people yes, don't try to course. do that. Of course, I build a profile on mm -hmm. someone. I, I don't act just based on hearsay and dubious inferences, uh, things that are said without fact or basis. You know, one of the first people that the attorneys instructed me to contact was a former Viper Room employee named Richard Albertini. <laughs> right. And they said, look, this guy's been calling us. This guy's been hounding us. you got to go talk to him. I think he's got some good stuff. Okay, so... I get a hold of Richie Albertini, 
by by way of Facebook, and uh, and I introduce myself. I let him know what's up, what I'm trying to do, and he proceeds to tell me about how Johnny Depp is a a Satanist. He's a um, he's responsible for the death of his ex business partner Anthony Fox. He's responsible for the death of River Phoenix. He put a cigarette out on the dance floor on a woman's forehead. He beat up Kate Moss, and he was just going on and on and on and on. I went back to the attorneys. I said, look, this guy is talking through his rear end. They said, well, we want you to check it out nonetheless. Hmm. I said, okay. Of course, I checked it out. I talked to other people that Albertini worked with at the Viper Room. Olivia Barish, a well-known child actress who was on Little House on the Prairie. Um, Richmond Arquette, who comes from the famous acting family, the Arquette family. And a number of other people. And they said, that's ludicrous. That's ridiculous. It's That's impossible. And I said, you know, that's what I thought. So... I put together the full report. I did my due diligence and I presented what I had to the lawyers, both Eric George and his partner, Rick Schwartz. And they said, oh, my God, let let this guy go. He's done. He's not credible. Fast forward to today. uh, He was represented for a while by team amber is a, a a would-be witness they never even thought about calling him True. as a witness oh well i mean i i listened to some recordings i could i can't even imagine putting someone like that on the stand because it would open you up to oh man a world of <laughs> a world of problems let's just say yeah there there have been a I'm not even going to humor some of the allegations that have been put out there. I had always wondered about the background of those allegations, why they came up. And that explains quite a bit there. That explains quite a bit because you didn't believe you actually checked out what you were told. Well, we rejected him. And I think it was that rejection that set him off. And the next thing you know, he's accusing me of murder, uh, murdering people. The comedian Paul Lynn, who's a comedic icon from Hollywood Squares, probably some of your uh, audience will remember Paul Lynn. And, uh, of course, this is years ago. He died in 1983. I broke into his house and I found his body. It was a horrible experience. And uh, he was a dear friend. In fact, I went on tour with uh, he and Beverly Sanders in uh, one of Neil Simon's plays uh, called Plaza Suite. And I, I played a, had a small role on stage. It was a lot of fun, but, but he, we were the very close, very good friends. And for Albertini to accuse me of murdering him was, was nuts. Now, there is a lot, and I do mean a lot more material that Paul has found, too. I mean, some amazing stuff about the Viper Room, about J.D.'s past. I mean, everything out there but we're going to end right here paul do you have something that you'd like to say in closing for this part no we're going to come back i love talking to you um i i love opening up to you i feel comfortable doing that with you why don't you and i umbrella man let us keep the door ajar Mm -hmm. and uh entertain your listeners again real soon